As director of social sciences of Wageningen University and Research, and also on behalf of the board of Wageningen University and Research, I'm proud to be the host of this morning session. I'm very grateful to the EU for having shown the vision several years ago that the social sciences, in collaboration with the natural and the life sciences, have a unique contribution to make to the societal challenge of food and nutrition security. That is, stable, healthy, and nutritious food consumption for all, while respecting environmental boundaries and the socio-cultural fabric of societies. Sustainable food security is one of the most pressing issues in the world. The number of people on our planet is growing. Agriculture has to produce more food on less resources. Furthermore, farmers are facing increasingly volatile and integrated markets for both input and output. And food prices spike while we saw half, like we saw half a decade ago, and they threaten particularly the poor people whose adaptation capacity is limited. Thus, the Food Secure Project was created to analyze the global food complex systematically, using quantitative uh, analysis methods and operating in the policy context of the Expo Milano process and European policy action. Today's forum is not a traditional end-of-project conference. We gather here today to mobilize you, our audience, around the question how you can benefit from the research work that we have done in making better contributions to food and nutrition security. And the Food Secure team is therefore grateful to co-organize this forum together with DG Research and Innovation and the Food 2030 conference around the shared commitment to make science work for and with society. And I do wish you an informative, inspirational and pleasant conference. I would like to introduce our honorable guest, Mr. Wolfgang Butcher, Deputy Director General for Research and Innovation and responsible for the policy and management of the Research Framework Programme. And in this capacity, is involved in the design and elaboration of Horizon 2020, the new for a framework programme for research and innovation, and also closely associated to its implementation. And it's rather clear that from this conference and from this project, Mr. Butchers expects indeed very, let's say, uh, applicable uh, consequences for policymakers. So let's hope we can fulfill that promise today. Mr. Butcher. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, uh, on behalf of the European Commission Director General for Research and Innovation, I would like to welcome you to our today's conference of the Food Secure Project that is coupled with a policy and science forum. This is a very busy day for research and innovation in Brussels because some doors further down, they are discussing the future of the next framework program. And I think many people have mixed up the place because they wanted to come to our meeting, but they were expecting a discussion on the future of the next framework program. So I'm happy that we have still now a project under framework program seven, whereas we are discussing already or starting to discuss the next framework program. But I think the point that Jack has just indicated will be crucial also in the discussion over there we need to produce impact, we need to translate research findings in the real world because this is the justification, whether we like it or not, that later on this year or next year, we get still an important research budget at the European level. So I really would like to welcome you, in particular Hans van der Meijl, the coordinator of this project, all those amongst you who have been part of this research project, but evidently all those of you who are interested in this domain and might help us to disseminate and to implement the research fundings of this project. I'm sure I do not need to convince you of the importance of research and designing sustainable policies for global food and nutrition security. Even if the latest food price crisis is behind us 
quite some time already. I was still in DG Agriculture then, I think. We all know that future crises, crises are looming on the horizon, feeding a planet of nine or more billion inhabitants and eliminating hunger and undernourishment are such a crucial global challenge. And this challenge, as you know, figures prominently amongst the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But it also figures prominently if you have a look at, at, at the risks uh, humanity is facing that has been developed in the context of the World Economic Forum in Davos. The issue of food security is both in terms of likelihood that the risks will occur and the impact, one of the major challenges of mankind. The European Union and its 28 member states are very well aware of the importance of these challenges ahead of us. As you might know, following the commitment taken at the last year's Milan World Expo, Commissioner Modest together with Commissioner Hogan, uh, will launch tomorrow the initiative Food 2030 on how research and innovation can ensure that future food systems are robust and sustainable. This initiative builds on the results of continuous and substantial EU funding for research and innovation for sustainable agriculture, food and nutrition systems and policies. In the last 10 years, the European Research and Innovation Framework Program supported researchers and innovators in this domain with more than 1.4 billion euro. And amongst these projects, the Food Secure Projects project has really a unique place uh, because of its particular design. In fact, the Food Security Project is the first research project to analyze the complex issue of global food and nutrition security systematically with the involvement of social sciences connected to agriculture, environmental, and other sciences. You know that the involvement of social sciences in research funding or in research projects is one of the key targets, but also challenges under Horizon 2020. And still today, two, three years after we have launched uh, Horizon 2020, this issue of bringing together sciences, life sciences, and social sciences is still a challenge. I'm really pleased to see that in the context of the food security, this integrated transdisciplinary approach was already pursued when Horizon 2020 was even not uh, invented. During the four-year period, food secure researchers explored new data sets and modeled future paths for the global food system. With a research contribution of 8 million euro, it is the most ambitious research project on global food and nutrition security funded by the European Commission under the seventh framework program. We particularly welcome a number of the innovators championed by the project in line with strategies for multidisciplinary open science and innovation. As I indicated, a major innovation is the approach to work together with stakeholders in creating foresight on global food and nutrition security. And 40 organizations have been part of this process. And again, this is also <clears throat> an issue which we have just discussed yesterday in the European Parliament. <clears throat> the question is how to communicate science to citizens. And evidently, all the technologies which are available today, and I think uh, the, uh, the Netherlands were one of the countries who has first explored this thing, <clears throat> the, the notion of citizen science. Citizens not only acting as, as kind of researchers, but citizens also being involved in the setting of the research agenda. And I think what they have done in the Netherlands was really very impressive because they had a nationwide consultation, public consultation, involving citizens to determine the research agendas in the different uh, areas, determine the research agenda in the sense to find out what citizens, what the population wanted 
to know that research should do. And I think we cannot do research if we want afterwards that this research is implemented, becomes <coughs> a reality because it fits to the mindset of people. We cannot afford to do research without this involvement of society if we want afterwards produce impact. <clears throat> it is also very important that Food Secure has invested in forging and strengthening linkages between the EU research community, individual researchers, institutions, and program from other world's regions, especially in Africa. This is a huge benefit for extending the science cooperation between the EU and the African Union, where evidently, as you know, food security is a crucial point of focus. Finally, the Food Secure project shows that the social sciences play a particularly important role in addressing many policy aspects of international cooperation and development policy. In this project, economists, sociologists, political scientists, geographers, anthropologists, and expert, experts on gender and legal studies joined forces to unravel and interpret the complexity of food and nutrition security. Beyond patterns of land use, crop yields, and market distortions, they also analyzed cultural, religious, legal, or gendered determinants of food production and consumption, both in Europe and in other world regions. And I think the older I get, I realize the importance of exactly these effects cultural effects, sociological effects. I think we have a lot of research already. I've just discussed it with Pierre a moment ago regarding uh, uh, Africa. There is a lot of research available. But how do you change mindsets that have not changed over centuries, over thousands of years? These are people, they are civilized people. They, they like the way they lived or they used to li like the way they lived? How do you make change their mindset to roll out new uh, research results? I think this is why this involvement of, of people and all these different sciences are so important in our research projects. Multidisciplinary projects like Food Secure respond to the manifest need to improve the availability of high quality, timely and reliable data and analysis. Policy making requires a better understanding of causality and toolkits that improve its foresight abilities. Following these considerations, I look very much forward to a rich and fruitful event organized around sharing and discussing research results, as well as policy recommendations. I wish you all an excellent and intellectually enriching day, and I, want, I would like to uh, share uh, Chuck's opening remarks. We have a lot of expectation in you, also when it comes to practically implement, disseminate the research results <coughs> that have been, uh, um, uh, that we have got thanks to this Food Secure project. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for your uh, kind words and introduction. Um, so there's a lot of, let's say, expectations regarding what Food Secure has done and uh, about the debate. So I think it's time to uh, call forward uh, Hans van Mel, the project coordinator, to enlighten us about the findings of Food Secure. So thank you all. Thank you all for, uh, for being here. It's a great honor on behalf of the whole Food Secure team uh, to give the opening uh, speech about a project I, I really like, Food Secure, interdisciplinary asset uh, by Mr. Wolfgang Butcher, uh, to explore the future of global food and nutrition uh, security. Uh, I do this speak on behalf of, uh, of all of us, especially of uh, my name, Hans Vermeer and uh, Tom Achterwals. With Tom, I, I really worked uh, the whole project together from the inception, and it was already in, uh, in 2010. 
where we were designing, I think at that time, a quite innovative setup of this project under the guidance of uh, our scientific coordinator, uh, also Joachim von Braun, Maximo Todero, uh, Joost Swinnen, and uh, Jean-Christophe uh, Bureau. So here are some of the results that we have in the four or five year project. So why was the food secure? Some highlights of the research. I focus on a few big things because uh, five year projects, Petra told me you can never get into 20 minutes. And I'll say a little bit about the scenario because they were very innovative, interactive with a lot of stakeholders, we're happy to see are also here today. And then I say a little bit about the policy science forum that we're going to go in depth uh, this afternoon. So why food secure? Why food secure is that we want policies, policies that matter. If you look at this picture in the eyes of these children, that's why food secure is all about. So, because if you go a little bit stock taking, the Lancet 2013 on nutrition, a massive unfinished agenda. There are still 165 children stunted. Malnutrition is still responsible for 45% of that in the five years. But also newer problems like uh, deficiencies of micronutrients. Two billion people in the world and also rapidly increasing uh, overweight obesity uh, is happening. More than 500 million people at the moment. So nutrition is really a big problem in the world. The FAO also estimated that's very costly. The economic cost of this malnutrition is 4 to 5 percent of global GDP. Why food secure? The immediate cause, I think, of food secure was the 2007 price spike. Then it takes a little time to get the horizon of the proposals. And in 2010, we have written the proposal in 2011, just uh, the second price peak, um, the project was, uh, was positively evaluated. The prices have gone down since that time, but as Mr. Bush just said, the, around the corner can be the next problem and the next price spike can be just in front of us. And the question is whether we are better able to respond. So the world food equation is still risk prone. It was at the time and it still is. Land degradation, water scores, scarcity are issues. Climate change is more prominent in these days. Also on the demand side, population is growing, income is growing, but also consumer behavior. We eat a lot of meat. We waste a lot of our products. And then a new things are happening, the wider bio-based economy to also use biomass for bioenergy and biochemicals. And then trade and markets, they can help uh, markets, but also uh, temper markets, supermarkets, it's a lot of market power, financial market interactions, protection, so on and so on. A lot of drivers that can easily um, influence uh, the, the food, the food uh, equation. So food secure, what is our main objective? The objective is to design effective and sustainable strategies for assessing and addressing the challenges of food and nutrition security. We want to have policies that matter for the short term and the long term. Some key features of our project, 90 research institutes from all over Europe, but as has been said before, also from all over the world. We have institutes from China, Brazil, uh, and also Ethiopia. It's very multidisciplinary. It's quite exceptional because it's, it's uh, directed to the social sciences, and for the social sciences, 8 million uh, euro is a lot of money. So we're very happy that we got this chance, but we want to do it Differently, we want interactive with stakeholders and also from the start an interaction with policymakers. So we are very happy that so many policymakers uh, uh, signed up today. Although some of them are next door discussing uh, the future. Um, we, of course, traditionally we did a lot of uh, academic papers, 60, 70 we have already. So we are also successful in that area. And um, just to say already to Mr. Butcher, we really at the moment investing quite some resources to get the user friendly access to our data to really influence uh, policy making but also uh, all of the world um, students, scholars, citizens who have access to our uh, results. So to sign up, the design of our project, we first focus on determinants, really try to understand the causes of hunger and nutrition because there are many factors between the 2007 and 2011 crisis. We want to go in the future because if you want to help policymakers, people, you have to look forward on the short term, volatility, but also on the long term. 
And then we want to provide guidance, policies that matter. And then to the whole project, we did not go off in our rooms, in our university, and design the project. Now we interactively with policymakers and with stakeholders. Some highlights. I can only focus on a few big highlights uh, of the project. And the first one I want to focus on is the food nutrition overall concept, because a lot of the details you will get later during the day. The well-known um, World Food Summit, food and nutrition security concept with four pillars, availability, stability, access, utilization. Production influences quite a lot, availability, stability. Income influences food access. Utilization is influenced by quality and quantity of food. We can steer them, influence them by innovation, technological innovation and institutional innovation. And this can be influenced by, by policies. But the problem, this is quite a static framework without causalities. And what we need is a dynamic framework wherein the four components are, are uh, interconnected. A step forward is the basic framework uh, introduced by the Lancet in 2008. There you see um, some causalities. The focus is on malnutrition of children and, uh, and women and immediate causes. There's not a lot of attention in the literature and the policies about the basis causes for the nutrition security. Policies and market failure needs to be addressed. So we came up with a framework, but in general is the four pillars, food and nutrition security of the World Food Summit, and extended with sustainable food system that contributes to health, to social inclusion, environmentally sound, and it should be viable for the enterprises. So you get a dynamic framework with many layers or dimensions. You need to go from the household to the global level. At the global level, often world food prices are determined. The household level, their disposable income is. How much income do they get? And how much do they spend on food? If we go to natural resources, we can use them just as they are, but we can also have guardianship. On the consumption side, for individual consumption to public health, short-term, long-term. Short-term events can have long-term implications and policies. They can help food and nutrition security, but we have seen in some of our research that it can also be very bad for food and nutrition security, as was happened in the reactions after the 2007 food crisis. So what are our lens at which parts of the world we are looking? We are looking, of course, also to Africa, because there's a lot of focus also from the European Union, and there's still a lot of, of poverty and food and nutrition security problems, and they are quite not dissolving so quickly. We also looked at, uh, at Southeast Asia. There's a lot of progress there, but it's often related to China, where there's high, high economic growth. Southern America, but we looked also within the European Union. In Eastern Europe, we had case studies in Slovakia and Romania, because food and nutrition security problems are also within Europe. If you go to access to food, micronutrients, obesity, these are also problems that are not only for the developing world, but also within Europe. This was very interesting. I liked it a lot, the participatory scenario development with a lot of stakeholders. Stakeholders from firms, NGOs, policymakers, citizens, all sitting in one room and discussing the future. What are the driving factors? What matters? It was a very interesting process and there was also quite, I see, some surprises. There was one moment in Brugge, I can still remember very uh, vividly, the stakeholders was quite a revolt because we were proposing long-run scenarios along the lines of the climate change IPCC scenarios. But our stakeholders refused to see the two axes, ability to uh, adapt or the ability to mitigate as the two central axes related to food and nutrition security. They stressed inequality. Inequality is a key dimension. And then we had a heavy debate. And at the end, we accepted that these new dimensions should be the core of new food and nutrition security scenarios. This meant a lot of work for us because we had to build new scenarios, new drivers, except that we could focus on food and nutrition security indicators. So what did we come up with? Food secure scenarios, two big axes. The one is more well known, from unsustainable world to sustainability world. It has to do with lifestyle, biodiversity, green. This you often see the dimension, but the new dimension is more to really focus on do you have an equal world, equal income distribution, or an unequal world? And then you get to world four worldviews. 
too little, too late. Some say maybe the world of today. We do not very care a lot about our environment, very unequal development in income distribution. There's not a lot of progress in, uh, in yields and fighting climate change and all these kind of issues. An interesting world, if we move to the 1% world, it's unequal but sustainable. It's very unequal. 1% of the world owns all resources, financially, but also natural resources. In their own interest, they are smart. In the long run, in their own assets, they invest in, uh, in, in a sustainable world, just to assure their, uh, their assets. And they take care that the people have just enough food uh, to survive. If you then go to the, to the green world, Ecotopia, it's a more equal world where, where people care for each other, uh, more equal income distribution, but also more sustainable. We care for the environment, we care for the home in which we are living. In this world, waste is reduced, people change their lifestyle, uh, they change their consumption patterns, for example, less meat consumption, and the, the growth is moderate, it's not that high. The food for all, but not forever, the blue world is a world quite focused on economic growth. It has the highest economic growth, and they also care for each other. So poverty, uh, hunger, the sustainable development growth, one and two, they disappear quite quickly. But they don't care so much about the environment. And in 2030 or 40, according to our stakeholders, this is not going uh, to end so long. There will be trouble. You can see it like this. We have this world in food for all, not forever. But over time, there's climate change, a growing human pressure, and ecosystems decline. Something happens, and then we get in trouble, and the world is not as it was. And yields are going down, food prices are going up, and the food and nutrition security problems are bigger. How did we do it? We invested also quite some time to have an integrated assessment toolbox, because climate change, food security, global level, household level, they all have to be integrated in our framework. And we made some first steps. In the economy-wide models, the Mirage of IFRI and our own uh, magnet model, we integrated the global level, the economy-wide level, and also some household groups. In this way, you get connections between income developments within a country of various household groups and where they spend their money on. We connected it with the global model of IASA. It's much more detailed on, on crop and forestry sector and a lot of spatial explicit information. Then we had also an integrated assessment model, the image model, um, and they connect the society, biophysical, and climate change. This toolbox, we could try to connect the macro and the micro level and some of the, the elements in the, the food and risk security framework. Some results. All the results you will see later in the, in the other sections. The inequality axis. What we saw is a lot of food growth can be catching up. If we're in an equal world, by definition, we said the GDPs are converging. But what we also saw, that this is not enough. You have people who are left behind, who are locked in. Their income developments are not very good. And the poor people get poor. So you need some additional policies, redistributive policies, like education, migration policies, of other policies, to reverse this pattern. From a sustainability perspective, uh, we did uh, model comparison. Uh, but what we saw is that it's not always the case that food and nutrition security and environmental sustainability are conflicting. There, are, there is a scenario where on the one hand you can reverse uh, biodiversity and at the same time have positive impact on food and nutrition security. The next figure, thanks to Hugo from uh, IASA, shows this quite a bit. We have the four security in two dimensions. On the rise on actions, you have the, the greenhouse gas emissions and on the kilo, kilocalorie per capita day, the food, security, um, the food availability dimension. If you look at the purple, that's of too little, too late. You can see emissions increase, and there's not a lot of progress in kilocalories per capita per day. In the food for all, not forever, it's growing very fast. So kilocalorie per capita per day, the blue line goes up, but after a crisis, it goes down. The green one, our ecotopia, that's the only scenario that succeeds in getting the greenhouse gas emissions down and increasing uh, food availability. Today's program, the science policy interface, that's why we're here. We invested a lot in getting a lot of policymakers here on board 
to discuss our results and also how should we move forward to have policies that matter. So in the morning session, we will um, discuss some determinants and there will be a few pitches that you get all the overview of all the sessions because you can only go to one of the, the parallel sessions. In the morning also we discuss the future, some of the modeling results, and in the afternoon we get the policy and science panels. The question is, if there is a nice a next food crisis, has Europe the right arms to fight the next food crisis? Can we have more um, effective policies? The EU is very active in, in a lot of respects in the food security domain. At the Food Expo and also to, tomorrow, the Fischer uh, report, there's a lot of attention for food industry security. During the whole lifetime of our project, our uh, researchers actively participate in interaction with policymakers. So we are also active in the Fischer report by Joachim von Braun and Jo Swinnen, who are co-authors of this report. The EU was active in the, the Sustainable Development Goals and also in the G7 Vision on Action for Food Security and Nutrition. Also, OSD published a report where there are three futures with a lot of uncertainties and important international cooperation. The Food Secure Toolbox was used to quantify the scenarios within this EU study. So during the project, we try to, to not stay at the universities, but be active with all kinds of stakeholders. Food systems, if you look at the new 17 uh, development goals, is in the heart of a lot of the sustainable development goals. It's for example, zero hunger, good health and nutrition, clean water, they are directly related, but also the climate ones, climate action, life below water, and also the, the ones related to economic growth. Food systems is in the heart of it. So we have all kinds of options. On the one hand, we can fight climate change. On the one hand, we can concentrate on food availability. I don't go into detail, but some options, they are beneficial for food availability, like a productivity increase, a diet shift, and others, like carbon taxes, they are good for mitigation, but they hurt the food access because they increase, for example, food prices. So Paris. In Paris, we have a very stable climate change agreement. And I think a lot of people are very happy that we take care of our home, the environment. It's like the, the Eiffel Tower. It's very stable. And we have a good agreement. And last week, there was a ratification by the Euro, a very fast ratification by all EU member states. But we have to be careful, because as I said, a lot of policies in climate, there's a big impact on agriculture. On the one hand, climate change can influence directly by weather and so on, the food supply side. And also, agriculture is one of the big emitters of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the world. So agriculture has to contribute if we want to go to the two or one and a half degree targets. If we go to the one and a half degree target, we need negative emissions. Negative emissions means you have to get carbon out of the air and store it in some place. But then bio, biomass is important because it's only the only one or source at the moment that can do it. So you need a lot of afforestation and bioenergy. And this has, of course, implications on food prices. So we have to be sure that the stable Eiffel Tower becomes not the Tower of Pisa from a food and nutrition perspective that we get to a very unstable situation. So what do we need? So maybe like in the climate change, we had all these IPCC reports. We get a lot of attention uh, for what's happening with the climate in the long run. And now we have a firm report. Do we need something similar for food and nutrition security? Reports that monitor what's happening with, with food and security. And also policies that should be effective in this respect. What we need is policies that really are effective in addressing food and nutrition security, and that we get to a world where um, food is affordable, healthy, and sustainable. I think that should be the goal of our conference, and we should see how we come there. So I hope you have a very nice food secure conference today. Thank you.